Hello all, thank you so much for being here virtually tonight. I am speaking to you tonight from the unceded ancestral land belonging to the Kickapoo, Osage, Kaw, Kanza, and Osheti Sakowin people. This land is promised to all these people and I am humbled to be able to be here with you all tonight. Indigenous people are the past, the present, and the future of this land. And now I'm gonna introduce our artist of the night, Dan Jian. So Dan Jian was born in 1986 and she is a visual artist who works across painting, drawing and animation. Originally from the mountain region of Hubei, China, Dan Jian came to the United States at the age of 19. She received her BFA from Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University and an MFA from the Ohio State University in 2016 with a minor in comparative study. Dan is an assistant professor of art at Texas Christian University and maintains an ongoing studio practice in Fort Worth, Texas. Dan's work has been exhibited nationally across the U.S. and internationally in China, Italy, and Korea. Her forthcoming solo shows will appear soon at Kansas City Artist Coalition in Kansas City, Women and Their Work in Austin, and Chris Worley Gallery in Dallas. In addition to many awards, grants, and endorsements, Dan is also a residency alumnus of Ragdale Foundation, Vermont Studio Center, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts, and finalist for the Don Bacardi Fellowship in London. <clears throat> In 2022, Dan is one of the four community artists selected by the Amon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth. And without further ado, I give you Dan Jen. Yay! Thank you, thank you. That was a long introduction. <laughs> I should pare that down for you. Um, thank you. And thank you for KCAC for this opportunity. I will jump right into my artist presentation, try to keep it under five minutes. Share screen. Can you see okay? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, I'll get started. Um, hi, good afternoon, good evening. It's six o'clock here. Um, I will be talking about my primarily my oil on paper tonight. And those are the body of the work that is currently on view with um, Kansas City Art Collision. And this is a talk that primarily started from the body of the work prior to the, to the body on view. Um, and I shall kind of wrap around the inspiration source image and the process a little bit. So the current body of the work is oil on paper. I want to present the body of the work came before that, which are uh, oil on canvas, regular canvas on stretcher. Those are a body of work that um, led to the oil on paper series. And it was a body of work that I started while I was in graduate school. I went to the Ohio State University. And just like many MFA who uh, had gone through graduate school, there was a time for reflection um, recollection and repetition and repetition of a failure, in my opinion, which is kind of what graduate school for. Um, I think a lot of us were encouraged to work through family history and the memories. Um, the subject that I was dealt with at that time were my mother and and my community in China. So what you're seeing here is oil on canvas of my mom on two separate canvas that uh, stacked together. My mother was uh, born and raised in China and came to United States as an immigrant in 2002 
just before she came over to US, she had a terrible car accident and was um, left totally disfigured. The hair on, on her head that you see in that portrait is a wig and her uh, skin was on her, on her skull was totally uh, ripped apart. Um, and that car accident left it, her left eye permanently unable to close. So she's always like squinting with one eye and that eye is always red and uh, um, inflamed. In the effort of trying to paint my mom, actually I had paint, made this painting many times um, and always left with dissatisfaction. I just don't know what was the pursue and what I really trying to captivate through making the portrait of my mom. Um, in this painting, I want to show you, I want to point out that middle window of a previous painting of the same subject based on the same photograph that she was just smaller and she was still trying to reach out and uh, touch the dog in the previous iteration. Um, in the process of painting it over, uh, I was compelled to leave a little window and to show the previous version of my effort. This painting is important to me because I realize there is no final version or final arrival of the painting. Um, making painting and the struggle of the search is part of the work. Um, and I became interested in reveal that search for looking as part of my work. Um, showing a few work from that period, uh, 2015, which was my um, graduating year of my MFA study. Uh, back then I was largely based on my work from observation and, and um, childhood photo. As you see that those are, um, the painting on the left is myself, the painting on the right is my cousin. Both picture are based on a childhood photo and at 1980, early 90s in China, there's still photo studio where you can go in and hold a plastic toy and get your photo taken. Um, but and my intention is not to paint the photo faithfully. I just want generally get a composition on there and then very quickly I get into this process of dis disrupt the portrait. Um, Again, never know how to arrive at a finished work, but it seems like that paint over or scraping or removal is very important part of the process. I paint quite spontaneously. So when most of the time when, uh, when I was told the work is good enough, I stop or, or I stop when I felt like I reached some kind of reconciliation with a photo or memory of that photo. That's kind of like how I worked throughout um, my three years of study. In this work, I just want to point out the decorative, um, decorative motif from Chinese painting. Those are actually motifs from um, porcelain, like cheesy, um, poorly painted, porcelain or ceramic object because they're glaze, which is really hard to control. So they have this kind of like funny quality to it. Um, and I like use them as stage set in, and then added me, the childhood me kind of like painted in a clown joker or funny or humiliating kind of way, um, writing a writing a rock course, this kind of juxtaposition of the five sun, which is um, 
Chinese motif about good fortune and good life. If you have five son in the family, it's like a good thing. Um, and me, who is, you know, a girl, and my dad always said that you're not, you're not, you're not a son, but you're almost as good as a son. And this kind of like juxtaposition, I thought it was a, a funny setup. But ultimately, I have to say, it was just motifs that it gives me an excuse to manipulate paint and to see what kind of cartoony effect that I can have. Um, another portrait that is me and my grandma. Um, go back, jump to one more slide. That was me and my grandma and was based on a photo, family photo again, but the decorative elements of the bamboo is even more evident here. I think I was looking at lot, lots of Laura Owens back then. She was in Frunshaw. Oh, I should add that um, before I came to United States, I was uh, trained to be kind of realistic painters. So this separation of what is flat and the decorative as well as what is photo real, pho photo realistic or naturalistic was a kind of interesting thing that I'm um, interested in manipulate. So going forward, showing some of the photo reference that I was looking at at the time. They're really just ordinary photos. Um, I have a habit of taking snapshot when I go back home. I came from a mountain region in China that is very close to the border of Hubei province and Sichuan. Um, on Saturday and Friday, there's still farmer's market, very informal farmer's market where farmers just bring their produce and the random things to the market and hope, hope to make a sale. They bring like fresh pr produce, of course, but also those um, what like what they have time to make on their own, like their art object. So this guy is showing a wooden horse that he <laughs> kind of like made from just the roots. Uh, like he's paying attention to the dark part of the birds and he's like trying to sell them. I love it. I love this. His, his happiness is evident and uh, that hand gesture of showing um, his proud art object in the just really middle of, a, middle of a street construction site. That's where the farmer's market is. This kind of innocent, direct, and also such a um, just evident way of how content and how easily they're happy, they always touch me. And the, that hand gesture of reaching out is a reoccurring motif. Back then, not very consciously, but and I realized it was um, the reaching hand of my mom trying to touch the dog after she came to United States. Um, and live a very, very busy, hardworking life and the hand here that is picking vegetable, the hand that is showing carved wooden animal. Um, I wasn't consciously single them out to draw, but it was a reoccurring motif for sure in many of my work. This work, I, it was a watercolor, chaotic watercolor. Um, I like to make the motif a little bit funny and that reaching hand is always something that I felt like it's a departure point of the work. So this piece of work is watercolor on paper from 2016, shortly after I came back from the trip. Um, time, as, 
as how it revealed itself, like a time of art making, time of searching for final arrival in work, uh, and the time of um, time as record of the process. As I had mentioned in the portrait of my mom that near the window shows a previous iteration of the work, it became more of a conscious pursuit in my work. Another way that I had manipulated or experimented with the viewing of the time is expanding the work horizontally. So it's kind of reminiscent of a Chinese, traditional Chinese scroll where you don't take in everything at the same time, but you kind of like start from one end and you and follow the composition suggested by negative space and positive space and the scenery uh, and the reach on the other end. They're not necessarily storytelling. However, it's sequential and that the time is embedded in the work. And in this case, I don't necessarily have to cover the top part um, and the bury the previous mindset in making, except allowing, it's like a, I, I am really just follow stream of consciousness in making the work and the, the work sort of like suggests it has its ability to keep expanding if I would like. Um, so time was experimented this way and I continue to think of this train of a thought or scroll as a way of play with the viewer or um, the audience's time and space in arranging my work kind of like theatrical way, like they're stacked and then lined up. Um, and sometimes there's no space in between work showing how I was, my interest of um, not just to make a singular painting, but painting or talking to each other. That was my effort. Um, none of those are part of the current show in KCAC, but they're important setups to my concerns within those, the current body of the work that is oil on paper. Um, before I start talking about the current work on view, it is also important for me to show a slide of my um, visual reference that is sort of like a recent um, visual, uh, important visual anchor in my work. So what is shown here is um, mirror, ancient mirror from Dunhuang region, it's a north, northwest region in China. It's a, like a gate city on Silk Road. So after Dunhuang, um, businessmen will enter the desert for many days of hard traveling. Um, so the city itself became a Buddhist hub where uh, many caves are carved out of the side of the mountain and those caves uh, became the site for the, lar the world's largest uh, site for Buddhist mural. Those are, they become very important part of my research um, because precisely because they're done by amateurs. You know, imagine in a desert city in the middle of nowhere. Um, they're done by amateurs and they're paid by patron or businessman who's about to enter harsh environments. So they're sincere in making those paintings as their tribute to prayer. It's like they're devotional and they're devotional images and their stories of Buddha, um, many, many lives of Buddha and, and animal and the mystical uh, animals. So what draws me, there are so many facts, 
fact that draws me, um, their A, their negative space is amazing. Um, you can, I probably need to show a bigger picture, but you can see the story, uh, the mountain divides up different picture planes. So one story transform into another story. Here are Buddhas um, listening to sutra or worshiping. And here it's those mystical deers or um, ego hawk that are reiteration or life forms of Buddha and uh, um, travel through this mountain, like the story shift again. So it's kind of like comic book, except that the scale is constantly shifting. And on top of that, the decorative elements just are so innocent, but beautiful at the same time, like the choppy rocks <laughs> that are two colors. Um, I love it. I was obsessed with it. Um, and I, this kind of like time and space traveling is very similar to the scroll that I showed earlier. Um, I hoping, I was hoping to have similar quality in new work. Um, that led to the kind of body of the work that I'm doing now. That was also a time that I started to switch in from oil on canvas to oil on paper. There are many benefits for working on paper. A, I can draw. I can draw and erase and go through kind of like a lot of um, drawing phases first and still keep this possibility of paying it over. Um, so ultimately I'm converting the painting process into a drawing process. I started to think of my painting as drawing even though they're filled of colors and I still use brush. Um, and that really has helped. I still need to put my finger on why think of the work as drawing really helps and what kind of difference it makes. You just do. Um, so the negative space became even more important and I still attracted to preserve the window, the window of the process, the window of the making as is shown here. And the hand gesture too, um, it's still like what this person's doing at the moment. This is a street dentist pulling out someone's teeth in the middle of the street. I, uh, I was so amazed by what I see, um, someone performing like ultimately a dental surgery in, the, in a busy street in China. Um, I made many drawings about this scene and this is the final version where I have a ghost like Chinese motif hovering over her as if the birds is providing some kind of comfort. Um, overlapping the space and time of the imagery motif was my intention at that time. Similar to the previous work here, it's a Tang Dynasty lady um, putting, putting a decorative hair, hair, hair piece on her hair. But here we also see a very contemporary plastic balloon that you see a lot in China. Um, so it's like a window within a window because you, arguably this is also a window of illusion and the canvas reveal itself what it is. Um, this sort of like needs to the most recent oil on paper and that was um, actually a work done in pandemic. I think it's evident that the imagery might get a little bit sadder. There was a lot of stabbing. <laughs> um, I eventually moved away from figure or portrait figuration uh, or human figure. Uh, there's always figure in my work. But think of like my making hand is a hand that I had previously um, 
pain will draw so many times. Like my hand is a hand who offers a wooden um, wooden horse in the farmer's market or the hand is a hand that is picking vegetable. Um, I started to realize that I, or I'm also interested just presenting the hand as a working neighbor on the surface of my painting. Like the struggle, the gesture, like when you do something like this, there's just something so wonderful, so energetic and so um, at the moment, I think if you took a crayon and just scrape paper back and forth like this, like a child, it's, it's very present. It's a very present way of drawing. You won't be thinking anything else other than making that gesture. Um, so gesture became the hand rather than the representation of the hand. And the, the paper is without deliberately pointing to the time, the paper keeps a record of every mark that I make. And within that as a given, that's the general premise of the oil on paper. Um, I try to arrive some sort of reconciliation of the image, which is um, kind of like setting up an impossible because well, if you begin with, if you begin oil painting by just making those violent, rapid gesture mark, and then the next thing I have to do is to solve my own problem or um, kind of sweep up my mess and still make it believable. And so the work became about that, like what is acceptable, what is not, um, and how do you reconcile the gestural marks? As you can see, those work all begins with violent gestural marks. And I have to get to a place that uh, the painting still stands as a painting with a balanced imagery and the mark making. So the work always began with gestural marks and violence. I do not know where work, work is heading to. I use those just remarks to set up the page. Um, or should I say, um, kind of have a skeleton of the composition. Then I stare at it to kind of pull out the storytelling, et cetera. In order to in order to know what to do, because if you just work with abstraction, and in fact, that's a lot of abstract artists does the same, whether they announce it or not. Um, in order to make abstraction work, you, I think artists in their head, at least I do, have some sort of figurative um, assignment or signifier that they're working with. For example, in this work, this is a rock that sort of have two legs. So it looks like um, like sideway C, letter C, and this is just another rock. Um, I think of them as a figure now, like they're in the foreground and the bushes and the trees all have this kind of like arms and they are in the background. Um, so, it's essentially a very abstract and gestural, gesturally done landscape of trees, rocks, um, branches, and some space. I give the energy back to the abstract color and mark making um, composition and the, the mass and the, the line rather than paint a scene. The earlier work there was more of like photo referenced scene that I captured. So um, that, that was the biggest shift from the previous work to that. Even the work that you're seeing here now is about two pears and a bunch of grapes. They are still as much about the still life as much as about the marks, colors, 
gestures and that sweeping um, pain in the back. The uh, ocean side was interesting because I deliberately painted this in a way that um, the rock where the branches sat on, it doesn't make any sense. It's almost like someone, a child has arranged some, um, some elements, like those are two miniature trees on the needle house. If we take this rock as a needle pedestal, the tree, it's impossible for the tree to grow on top of the rock, so it's a chopped tree. And the center of this rock is left blank as if it's inviting um, more object to get on there to, to be arranged. It's facing the viewer in a very kind of self-aware way. Um, for a while, I'm not sure how I feel about this work, um, but Milton Ivory's ocean was clearly in my mind, as you can see. He just had a big show in Fort Worth Modern. Just can't get enough. So more work, continue to play with the uh, nine marks and mass and the, um, the balance of all those elements. I try to be night-herded with my work because they don't always work. Um, there are times that I find myself just in the middle of the struggle and I'm like, why am I doing this in trying to solve the pictorial space of a painting? So this is actually a self-portrait. I am that bird who's, at, who's shocked <laughs> and the, the, the conflict, which is um, symbolized by those arrows and the shell is at a near distance, but the bird is looking to a different direction. So what's shown here is one of the earliest oil on paper where I really discovered you can like prep the surface pretty thick with oil stick, then just take a color pencil and they kind of essentially scraping into the work. Um, I'm finishing with one of the rare dark painting where I started to use stencil. Um, Cut, cut the shape of the rock and the branch and then brush over the dark paint over it. That's why the sticks starting to repeat themselves. Um, starting from there, I think from started from this work and moving on in 2021, I started to work with cutout directly kind of like started a new series, which is what I'm currently working on, where the stencil work cutout become the direct cut and paste kind of process in constructing the work. And the, the uh, sort of like singled by this work, um, I am gradually working with less and less color. Uh, now I'm working just 100% monochrome and also started to think about making animation, stop motion animation, just because I felt like um, whether I admit or not earlier, there's always a sense of um, abstracted storytelling in the work. So I think this it's time to own up to it and uh, uh, start manipulating. So that's where I am at for today's talk. Thank you very much for attending. I'll stop share. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. I loved, um, Marissa said, I love seeing the evolution of your work and I absolutely agree. Um, and she also said, I could totally see your work as a stop motion. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, which is really interesting, especially considering the, um, I think like some of the work you had originally applied with was animation. That was like really interesting to see. And I think I totally agree that it is storytelling even in an abstract form. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you, cause you mentioned, um, it was really interesting seeing like the arrangement of your er early works, like the way it wasn't like necessarily like the traditional hanging style. And you also mentioned um, paper as like record keeping, but I also am interested in how uh, the scale of your work contributes to the way you portray memories and narratives. Um, cause we did see like different types of scales throughout your talk and in the current work now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, I think when you work smaller, we recall things differently, just because in short, um, in smaller surface, you were able to kind of like encounter that struggle. Um, and I'm someone who deliberately invites struggle were impossible into my practice for um, for a possibility of kind of like getting to unknown part of the process. What I mean by that, mm, I have always been pretty diligent in keep up the practice of drawing. So I can draw something fairly quick um, and that just so like a, a bag of lemon that I draw. It's in front of me. So I I enjoy like tedious drawing and uh, realize to to be able to realize a vision that I had in mind. And so if the work is small, if the surface is like within approachable approachable size. You very quickly became about that. I'm like I have this idea, I'm gonna draw a bag of lemon, and get really, really tedious about that net and the texture of that little golden ring that holds the net together. It just became about see if you can do it. When you work bigger, uh, it's so much easier to lost to get lost in the process, um, and it's it's it can be a nightmare. And I think that's what artists are striving for. It's kind of like if you're a um, surfer, you always crave for the next big wave to get killed. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's where the excitement is. When I work bigger, I take more risk and I fail more. Um, and it gets more expensive and they kind of like deal with all kinds of condition. I think to be able to push push against the condition is what changes the work. Does that does that answer your question? Definitely, yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, another uh, another question I have is this one's a little bit more, I guess, simple. But um, uh, you mentioned the Mogao caves, and also in uh, your artist statement, you talk about um, the Tang uh, Tang Dynasty artwork. Um, but I was wondering if there are any other particular, um, like specific artists that you're inspired by um, in art history. Oh yeah, yeah, um, a lot. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, in my earlier time, graduate school time, I looked a lot of Norons and um, Saitambuli is an all time favorite. And a lot, a whole generation of abstract expressionist, um, John Mitchell, to name one, and the figurative painter, um, Alice Neal, they are all influential in all kinds of way. I think you can, you might even be able to like finger point at bits of influence here and there. Um, but currently, especially with the current work and the recent work, I turn to historical period more and more often. Um, the Dunhuang mural, uh, 
absolutely influential, but it's really hard to you to reference them directly. They're stylistically, they're so unique. It's almost like hard to chew them up and abstract them and work with them directly. I do currently, I do look a lot of um, like Asian ink scroll, like those Sumi ink landscape on a long rice paper scroll. Um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, I look at them all and they are actually very connect, collected in, in so many different aspects. I think there is a humbleness in their usage of Mayan color. A lot of them are monochrome. I'm, I found myself attracted to like more sub, subdued but time invested art, even uh, miniature art, Persian miniature painting or great attraction to me. They, if, if I have to summarize a common quality is that they're devotional. That is that whether the work is received by the market or not, it's almost like irrelevant. They are an artist or painter's devotion to the practice. And I still trying to get to that place. It's humbling to see master's work um, that is so devotional and so unconcerned of the external conditions. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a thousand years until I get there. Um. I have, I'm really interested in the way in like memory in general. And this is a conversation I've had with like one of my close friends where um, I guess how we perceive memory, especially depending on our family structure, um, because I feel like so many of my memories may not even be actual memories, but retelling of stories um, like basically stories that I've been told by like my parents or my older siblings and I put images to that, those stories and I'm like, those are my memories. Um, does that make sense? Like, do you ever think about that, about how maybe how our memories are influenced or how they maybe not, may not even be our own memories, but stories that we've been told? Oh yeah. Like, like fabric, almost made to be Neve kind of memories. Yeah. Um, Wow, I feel like I have to think about that. <laughs> I, um, I'm thinking, tell me if it's close to what you're thinking. I'm thinking of history, how history is always tinted by the narrator. Yes. But memories bodily, well, arguably history is bodily too. But we, we think of, we, we treat memory more intimate because we're like, oh, I remember. But history, we think of it as like third person um, nar narration. I think memory has a lot to do with um, the kind of identity that we are gravitate toward. Would you agree? Like, like even say you had a Nala Pap and I had a Nala Pap. Um, you had a great time. I had a great time. But later, I might my memory might be altered to like fighting for an alipop <laughs> rather than the taste good part uh, to reiterate that I am a go getter or something like that. Like, yeah. I wonder. Yeah, absolutely. And I, oh, um, I think a good good way to enter your topic is that. I think I do believe I'm selective in my cultural memory and the personal memory because um, the Chinese American position that I'm in, which is, you know, um, I think any member, any immigrant, immigrated member had to face the challenge of cultural loss. And maybe the, the Chinese scroll where literary painting tradition is so much more like delicious because uh, the subconscious fear of culture loss. So I, I studied some ink painting and it was uh, never so 
interesting until I had moved away from it. So doesn't does that talk back to your topic? Maybe memory is only relevant to how far away you are from that actual lived event. Yeah, definitely. That that is definitely also where I was getting at because I was like I guess I was like thinking more of like childhood memories because it childhood memories are so different from like the memories you make past right. a certain age right, right. um but yes um I wanted to ask if anyone else had any questions because we are at the 10 minute marker I don't know if Marissa you had any questions or any of your crowd have any questions I did just kind of want to harken back to the conversation you're having about memory and just ask um two questions I think in, co in conversation with the, the conversation you're having. Um, I'm curious, Dan, do you um, do you work exclusively from photographs that you take when you um, when you paint your your kind of memory landscapes? Or do you kind of like Isabel's talking about like recall memories and then place them on um, the surface? Um. The current work, I don't work with any photo. No, I'm lying. Uh, I work with reference photo. Like I work with photo like this. Uh, that's one of the current reference I'm trying to use. So it's a miniature painting. And I work with, so I don't work with like photo that I take anymore. Um, I could show you another one. Um, and I, I keep them right next to me when I need to refer to like, how thick is a line? How many marks on to represent tree leaves? It's very, very abstract that concerns. Um, where look at this weird composition. How can I um, like not duplicate, but like how can I achieve similar kind of surprise composition? So I no longer work with like seeing or snapshot of my photo. Um, I still take plenty of them. I find that if, because I had a social realistic kind of like training, I find that when I have a photo in front of me, sometimes it's more restricting than helping. Um, plus I, the, under, started during COVID, I think it's more interesting to make um, like landscape that I never been to, that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of the personal memory or cultural memory that trickled in. I just, I'm not consciously pursuing those. That's wonderful. Thank you for that answer. And then I, I just kind of want to ask about the term memory landscape. It's not something that I've heard before. Is that something you've pulled from um, someone else or, or is it something you've completely constructed in describing your work? Um, Landscape was, it's always around as a key vocabulary in my work. Um, I started to call them introverted in landscape because you can't find it anywhere on earth. And they are kind of like sight, but only exist in your head. Uh, so no, I, I didn't find it anywhere. Um, I'm sure there's a lots of writing about landscape and how they, function, but if you look at the, the ancient work of um, Chinese work or Japanese painting, they a lot of time they have a very realistic name. This says, this is a garden from Suzhou. But you look at painting, you're like, how can that, like, are you kidding me? It's, it, it looks, bleh. it's so abstract that um, you might as well like, you know, call this as like my backyard in Fort Worth, like that kind of relationship. So, um, so they are fabricated. Um, and they, I think the memory are pulled like piecemeal from various time and space. I just really love that. Like when I was reading your artist statement and just that word, or that kind of compilation of words of a memory landscape just really sent me looking at your work in a really different way um, and gave, it made me look a lot longer and deeper um, for some reason. It just, I don't know if that was just me or if that's the intention when you're writing about it, but it just really felt um, a lot more intimate 
um, and kind of looking at your work. Um, I just really enjoy it. So thank you. Yeah, it's intentional. In spite of my very extrovert uh, personality, the painting and drawings are um, very introverted and very, very um, meditated, you know, lots of time staring at it and kind of pull, pull image out of, from reference on the head. Um, and I think that's perhaps what contribute to that terminology and that your experience of it. Well, thank you. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it for the thank past couple of weeks you in the for your feedback. I, I ah. appreciate it. Yeah. All right. I, um, I didn't anticipate to talk that long. Well, <laughs> it went out of control. That's okay. It was awesome. I loved hearing about the evolution of your work and seeing the evolution of your work. Thank you so much for sharing with us. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, to whoever may watch this, um, please go see Dan's show. It's up till the 27th. It's incredible. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.